Good evening, folks. Oh, here, I have it. Uh, welcome uh, to uh, this evening to the center, our beautiful center. Um, glad to see so many folks out. Brave the storm. Now it's over. You've dug yourself out, and you managed to get here. So excellent. I was asked to. I'm, I'm the mayor of Dryden, Jack Harrison. I was asked to provide. Oh, thank you. I was asked to provide uh, greetings tonight, which I'm very pleased to do. You know, as the topic is a weighty one um, for the city of Dryden, even though we didn't put our hand up to host it. Uh, here we are trying to understand the complexities of nuclear waste and what that means to us. You know, I used to think the saying, uh, may you live in interesting times was a blessing, but I, I just recently found out that that was actually a curse. Um, for your enemies, interesting times is a code word for trouble. And so most of us want to live in peace and tranquility. So tonight we have the privilege of hearing Dr. Gordon Edwards, who Brene and Lloyd will introduce later. I had the privilege of spending an hour uh, with Dr. Edwards and Bernane, and, and I got a history lesson of how long ago this has been going on, since the 70s, and uh, so I'm sure you'll really enjoy how the knowledge that uh, Dr. Edwards brings to this topic. Um, this evening is sponsored by We the Nuclear Free North and Alliance of Organizations uh, that are not in favor of the proposed DGR in our area. And I do appreciate the time and the energy and the funds that the Alliance has put into their role of being a critical voice uh, for the DGR proposal. You know, I personally believe the critical voice is very important in all aspects of life. Um, I, I didn't come from the political world, I came from the business world, and it was very important for us as in our business, in the team that we, that we uh, had to uh, promote our business. We often would get together as a team and say, you know, we're always looking at continuous improvement. How can we do better? And, and team member would bring forward a great idea with great enthusiasm. And it was basically our job to, the rest of the job of the team, to pick it apart and find out, well, what could go wrong with this uh, brilliant idea? And, you know, at first the, the team was hesitant, but they realized this, we're not going after the person. We're going after the idea. Does the idea a good one? Is it going to uh, be effective for our business? So I'm a big fan of critical voice. I think it is important, you know, to make wise decisions. And for the end, it's a betterment. Uh, so we don't make the big mistakes that will hurt us. So, yes, I appreciate critical voices. The title of this event is Radioactive Waste, The Questions Multiply. And uh, I thought about a, a verse that, that I, that's very important to me. It's found in the book of Proverbs. It says, the first person to present his case seems right till another comes forward and questions him. And with that, I'll call up Brennan to introduce Dr. Gordon Edwards. Great. Uh, thank you, Mayor Harrison, and thanks to all of you for being here this evening. We're just thrilled to be here. My name is Brene Lloyd, and I work with a group called Northwatch, and we are one of the many groups in the uh, alliance, We the Nuclear Free North, which Mayor Jack already mentioned. And this is day four of our five-day tour. We're really uh, excited to have Dr. Edwards available to uh, visit our communities in northwestern Ontario for, for this five-day period. And, uh, uh, and I, I really just am very thankful that we've got such a, such a great turnout tonight, and I want to thank the local groups, um, No Nuclear Waste in Northwestern Ontario and Sunset Country Spirit Alliance for all their support uh, in uh, bringing this event uh, to you this evening and to our, to our live stream uh, audience. So, Dr. Edwards, I'm, I'm pleased to introduce and I'm gonna give you a very short version of his biography. You can go on his website, which he'll tell you about, and find the very long version. But in brief, um, Dr. Edwards is a, uh, a, ma a mathematician. Uh, he has multiple degrees, BAs, a couple of masters, a PhD, has done postdoctoral work in both uh, mathematics and uh, scientific fields, and has been an expert advisor to many different fora. Uh, to uh, commissions, inquiries, uh, and has been a great uh, asset to the public. Uh, years ago, many years ago, 
decades ago, actually, there was a, uh, an analysis done by the nuclear industry of the, what they called the opposition groups. And what they had to say about Dr. Edwards with the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility, and it's many years since I've read this, so I won't have it word for word, but what they had to say was that he represented a threat to the nuclear industry for his ability to explain complex scientific matters in a way that was understandable to the public. So imagine that, the a threat to be able to explain things. And, I, and, and it is absolutely uh, the right way to characterize Dr. Edwards. He is able to explain complex matters, uh, scientific matters in a way that we can uh, all as non-technical people we understand, uh, and we all need to, uh, we're all on a, on a learning curve uh, with this issue, this issue of nuclear waste and the Nuclear Waste Management Organization's proposal to transport, then process, then bury, then abandon all of Canada's high-level radioactive waste at a site uh, between Ignace and Dryden the Revel, uh, the Re in the Revel area. So we are going to have, we're going to hear from Dr. Edwards, and then we're going to have uh, some time for question and answer uh, between you, yourselves, uh, and Dr. Edwards. So as he's speaking, think of your questions, save them up, and, uh, and we'll be happy to entertain them after his presentation. So thank you again all, and thank you, Dr. Edwards. Comes John Swift. John, I'm not, I forget how to turn it on. Sorry about that. He may be an optimist, <laughs> <laughs> but he's not a sound tech person. Oh, okay. Oh, very good. Okay. Well, thank you so much uh, to the city of Dryden, to the mayor for his wonderful introduction, and also to Bernane for her fantastic work. Really, she has been, I think, and her organization has been uh, playing a, a very important role of just giving the information that the industry is not giving. The industry, it's understood that the industry has these bright ideas and has these uh, uh, enthusiasm for its own ideas, uh, but they oftentimes are more interested in, in selling that idea than they are in explaining what could go wrong, what, what could possibly uh, be a downside to their proposals. So it is very important to, uh, to hear more than just one side of the question. And that goes for the negative and the positive side. One has to listen to all sides and filter them. Um, I also want to thank the Sunset County Spirit Alliance and No, Country Wa no Nuclear Waste in Northwestern Ontario, as well as We the Nuclear Free North, organizations which have all contributed to this uh, process. Um, so I'm going to give a, a, a short condensed presentation so that we have time for questions and answers, but I want to refer you to the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility's website, which is located at www.ccnr.org. There's lots of information there on radioactive waste and nuclear technology generally, so uh, feel free to consult that. Now, uh, I, I'm going to start by posing a few questions since, uh, since my, my, the topic is radioactive waste, the questions multiply. What are some of these questions? And of course the wastes are also multiplying because as we speak, uh, ev the reactors are operating, more waste is being produced, and in fact the Canadian government and the Ontario government are planning to build now new reactors uh, which will add to the uh, waste production. And this raises a lot of questions that were previously not presented by the nuclear industry. In fact, they seem to be almost at, at odds with what people previously understood about this program. Um, one of the first questions is, Canada will not import radioactive waste. 
Now, I've heard NWMO promise this several times over and over again. No, no, we're not going to be importing radioactive waste from other countries. Well, the question is, will that promise be kept? Well, we had just recently, two years ago, found out that our ex-prime minister, Jean Chrétien, as a lawyer, was part of a secretive project to, in fact, import nuclear waste, the high-level nuclear waste, so you irradiated nuclear fuel, to Labrador. And he defended this program by saying that, well, Canada has a responsibility to uh, look after this waste. After all, we export uranium. People use that uranium and produce radioactive waste. Don't we have an obligation? But this was all secret. This is without any public notification, without any public debate, without any intention to tell the public about it until it was a fait accompli. So uh, this, of course, is very upsetting because people were given firm assurances that we will not be importing nuclear waste from other countries. Recently, just within the last month, uh, the Canadian government has put out a radioactive waste policy. They did not have a proper radioactive waste policy until just very recently, and uh, we are extremely disappointed in the policy statement they have come out with. And in that policy statement, it also says that Canada will be importing radioactive waste, including radioactive waste that have nothing to do with Canada, either in origin or in production. So um, this is a promise that is not being kept and will not be kept. And I think people have to be careful about depending on such promises. Another promise that has been made, which is not explicitly promised, but that the DGR, the Deep Geological Repository, will basically be reserved for the fuel from our reactors, from the fuel for Canadian reactors, and these are called can-do fuel bundles. Each fuel bundle is about the size of a, of a fireplace log, but they're deadly objects once they come out of the reactor. Many people are surprised to know that when the fuel bundle goes into the reactor, it's made of natural uranium coated in, in a, a metal called zirconium. And in fact, you can handle it fairly, quite safely as long as you wear gloves and don't stay too long, uh, it's safe to handle. When it comes out of the reactor, on the other hand, it's one of the most deadly objects on Earth. It turns out that a used fuel bundle, the moment it comes out of the reactor, would kill any human being in 20 seconds by just standing one meter away from it. And why is that? I will explain why that is in my presentation. But this is the uh, extreme danger of these fuel bundles. They're millions of times more radioactive when they come out of the reactor than when they go in the reactor. Uh, these small modular reactors that they're talking about building these days, they're already planned. We have one planned for Chalk River. It's called the micromodular reactor. And it has a completely different kind of fuel than the can-do fuel bundles. They're made of little particles which are called trisoparticles, and they're coated, the triply coated particles, and they are made of enriched uranium. We don't use enriched uranium in Canada. We've never used enriched uranium in our commercial reactors. But all of these reactors are going to be using either enriched uranium or plutonium as fuel, and that poses special dangers that do not exist with the can-do fuel. The Moltec stable salt reactor is planned for New Brunswick. That uses enriched uranium and plutonium, in fact. The ARC-100 reactor is planned for New Brunswick. That also uses a sodium, liquid sodium coolant and, once again, enriched uranium. The one that you might have heard about here in Ontario is the Darlington BWRX-300 reactor. Um, and there we're talking, in all these cases, we're talking about High-level radioactive waste produced by these reactors will have unorthodox geometry. Now, that may sound like a simple thing, but it's important because it means it doesn't fit into any of the containers that were designed for the can-do fuel, and therefore it doesn't fit into any of NWMO's current plans. The transport containers that NWMO is planning to use will not be suitable for these. The, uh, the burial containers with the copper coating and so on they will not be suitable for these. So they have to be redesigned. Who's going to pay for that? And these companies who are promoting these new reactors are American and British companies. They're not Canadian products. So uh, it's very important that these companies be made to pay the cost 
of the reactors they're building, including the cost of handling the waste. And yet, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, our regulatory agency, refuses to look at that. They say, oh, now's not the time. Let's license the reactor and let it run, and then at the end of their lifetime, then we'll start worrying about what to do with the waste. Well, as you well realize, that's kind of putting the cart before the horse, and putting the horse after the cart. Uh, but in addition to the unorthodox geometry, a much more important thing is that you can have what's called accidental criticality, something which is not possible with can-do fuel. When you put can-do fuel in a location, and even if it's flooded with water, which it will be underground, um, you don't get an, uh, the chain reaction that, that produced the waste in the first place will not get restarted. But with this new fuel, enriched uranium, you can, just with ordinary water, you can have an accidental criticality, which means a chain reaction, just like what happens inside a nuclear reactor, occurs underground in the repository. That produces so much energy that it will seriously harm the integrity of the repository, as well as harming the fuel containers and the canisters, because it's a blast of intense energy. Uh, now, of course, they plan for uh, preventing this from happening by separating the fuel bundles far apart so that they do not, they're not close enough to make an accidental criticality happen. But over the years, things degrade, things decay, things sometimes pulverize, and you can have movement of the contents of these waste bundles. And if they come close enough together in sufficient con concentration, then this accidental criticality can happen. It's something that has to be thought about. Another thing is that these new fuels are more corrosive. The, the can-do fuel bundles don't have any salt in them. But the reactor they're planning for New Brunswick, the Moltex reactor, is molten salt. And salt is very corrosive. You put that down into a repository, it's going to accelerate the corrosion. Uh, of uh, We expect a certain amount of corrosion, but we try to minimize it. In fact, the reason they put a copper coating is to prevent corrosion. Um, in addition, one of the uh, fuels we're going to have is going to have liquid sodium metal attached to the fuel, and it's very difficult to separate it. Um, if anybody knows their high school chemistry, you'll know that sodium, when it's in an elemental form, reacts very violently with water and releases a lot of heat and so on. So these are all, and, and finally, the, the last point is increased heat generation. These fuels are all going to be more radioactive than the can-do fuel, more radioactive per kilogram. And that means that the heat generation is going to be greater as well. In case you don't know that one of the problems of disposing of geological, geologic disposal of this type of waste is the fact that it is a heat generating substance. And even when they put it underground after 70 years of cooling off at the surface, it's still generating heat. And I, I have some diagrams I'll be show, uh, unfortunately they're not in this slideshow, but uh, at um, Atomic Energy of Canada Limited produced a series of diagrams showing how the heat warms up the rocks and uh, expands the heat zone uh, considerably until it reaches a maximum of about 4,000 years afterwards. That's the maximum zone of heat. And then it diminishes slowly, and it doesn't get back to normal temperatures again until 50,000 years have gone by. They call that period of time, that 50,000 years, the thermal pulse. Well, these new fuels are going to be even hotter, generating even more heat, and that complicates the whole design of the repository even further. There's another promise, and that is that used fuel will not be reprocessed for plutonium. Actually, if you read the fine print in the NWMO documents, they say that, they, that that's a possibility. It could be reprocessed for plutonium, but they say that, uh, that it's not very unlikely because it's not economically profitable, and uh, so they minimize the danger of that. However, will that promise be kept? Well, it turns out that already Canada is investing in exactly that technology in New Brunswick. They've given $50.5 million to the Moltex Corporation, originally from the UK, precisely to take the plutonium out of the can-do used fuel bundles. Now, now, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with taking plutonium out of can-do used fuel bundles? Well, one of the things is that you can't get the plutonium out without taking the fuel bundles apart. And when you take the fuel bundles apart, you liberate all of the contents 
And then you have to worry about the fact that they're no longer in a compact solid form, they're dispersed. How do you then manage that waste? That becomes more dangerous, more difficult to, wa to manage than the solid waste that we started with. But there's another problem too, and that is that plutonium is the stuff that is used to make atomic bombs. And in fact, we gave a reactor to India as a free gift a long time ago, and in 1974, India used that reactor to produce plutonium for their first atomic bomb, which was exploded in 1974. Um, now, there's a separation between the bomb and the reactor, and I, I, I told my friend Bob that it's a kind of a firewall, and so he actually drew a wall of fire, literally. <laughs> and what is this firewall? Well, the firewall is the radioactivity. I told you already that the fuel bundle is so dangerous that it will kill any human being in 20 seconds. Well, that r intense radiation acts as a, uh, as a protection. You can't just go and take that stuff and use it for bombs because anyone who approaches the fuel too closely is going to die. So that gives you a certain protection against weapons use. However, if you separate the plutonium out using a robotically controlled factory called a reprocessing plant, then the plutonium becomes much easier to transport. In fact, you can even smuggle it across borders. And, uh, it's, uh, uh, and that means that it's available not only to be used as fuel, which is what the nuclear industry is thinking of, but you can also use it for bombs. Now, Canada wants to sell these reactors around the world because climate change is not just a Canadian problem, it's a worldwide problem. That means that all kinds of countries around the world are going to have, for the very first time, access to plutonium through Canadian technology. We saw what happened when India had that possibility. Are we foolish enough to think that other countries aren't going to use that plutonium for bombs as well? Because once you give them the ability to separate plutonium, uh, they have that option themselves. They can decide whether to use it for civilian purposes or for military purposes. That reprocessing plant replaces the firewall. There's no more firewall. The plutonium can come out the front door to go to fuel a reactor, or it can go out the back door to make a bomb. And uh, I've also thought about the indigenous rights, the rights of indigenous people. How are these indigenous rights affirmed and exercised? Well, we know that these legally binding documents like treaties are so important because the courts recognize that this is a legal document. It's, a, it's not just a promise. It's a legally binding promise. And the courts can therefore tell the government, you cannot uh, just simply ignore these treaties. You have to recognize them, you have to acknowledge them, you have to respect them. And so the importance of having a written document is uh, 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 very important. And I would recommend that anybody who is being considered or is thinking of uh, uh, saying yes to the NWMO proposal insist upon something like a treaty, something like a written document that will hold the NWMO to account. And in that written document, you can make conditions you can say, for example, you don't want to have reprocessing in this area. You can say that uh, uh, you don't want to have this unorthodox fuel in this area. You can specify conditions, uh, and that gives you some protection. Um, now, in, uh, uh, for example, down in Port Hope, Ontario, some of you might even remember that a long time ago, there was a, for eight years, in fact, in the 1980s and early 1990s, uh, a government agency called the Siting Task Force was looking up north for a willing host community to accept the low-level radioactive waste from Port Hope, Ontario. I, was, I went to Atacokan at that time in Thunder Bay uh, speaking on that very subject. And uh, what happened is that they came up empty-handed because no community was willing to accept those wastes. That could also happen with the NWMO. They may come up empty-handed if no community wants to accept the waste which might not be such a bad thing because, you know, one has to ask the question, why is it so important to move the waste from point A to point B? Why is it going to be safer at point B than it is at point A? And it, couldn't we make it much safer at the origin, where it is? Um, is it necessarily safer when you move it up to a northern community or to any kind of remote community? And uh, those questions have to be asked. And it's also important to know that when NWMO submitted its first report to the Government of Canada in, 19, in 2005, they said, 
that there were three options. And one of the options was to keep the waste where it was and to repackage it as necessary. Uh, and they said they could do that quite, quite happily for hundreds of years. So uh, that is an option. Uh, another option would be to just have a centralized storage area somewhere, kind of like a parking lot for radioactive waste. And a third option would be to the deep underground disposal that they're talking about as a possibility here. So you should bear in mind that, uh, that this is not the only option that exists for these wastes. Um, now, I, I, this is a picture of uh, Matthew Kuncombe, who was the Grand Chief of the Cree, the Cree Nations of Quebec. And uh, he was a strong leader. And he said uh, famously, we do not own the land. We do not live on the land. We are the land. And uh, just expressing the strong bond that Indigenous people feel towards the land and especially towards the waters and the, the instinct to preserve it and to protect it for literally thousands of years. Most Canadians don't know what a thousand years really is, but uh, I think the Indigenous people know very well what we mean by thousands of years. And uh, in fact, we brought about, partly through the leadership of the Cree Nation, uh, a moratorium, a halt to all uranium exploration and mining in the province of Quebec. This is a picture of the people attending the World Uranium Conference that took place in Quebec City. And this is right outside the National Assembly, which is the Parliament of Quebec, the Legislature of Quebec. Um, and we see in the front the, the banner saying, Committee for Future Generations. That's an Indigenous-led committee, which is really saying uh, we we really want to protect future generations. So uh, preventing permanent radioactive contamination, the most important feature of that, in my opinion, is to not allow on-site handling of damaged used fuel bundles, because when these fuel bundles are damaged, you have to think of the fuel bundles not as the waste. The waste is not the fuel bundle. The fuel bundle is only the container of the waste. The waste is inside the fuel bundle. If the fuel bundle is broken or damaged, then those wastes can escape. And some of those wastes are in the form of gases. And some of those wastes are in the form of vapors, which are gases for a while, and then they condense onto surfaces. And some of them are in the form of dust, which can, which can travel great distances. So, um, so think of the fuel bundle as a container of the waste, and the actual wastes are inside that fuel bundle. If the fuel bundle's damaged, the radioactive waste do escape. Uh, now, uh, just, just to give a quick sort of rundown of where nuclear energy comes from, I have to tell you that the discovery of nuclear fission took place just one year before I was born. I was born in 1940. The discovery of nuclear fission took place in 1939. That means that these wastes are only as old as I am. These wastes are only about 83, 84 years old. And uh, prior to that, they were not found in nature at all. Because these wastes are not just the leftovers of nuclear power, they are created inside the reactor uh, from, you might say, from nothing, but actually from uranium. Here's what happens. Oh, by the way, the power of the atom, this is a single bomb that was dropped on a city of Hiroshima in August 6, 1946. That bomb was made of only a few kilograms of highly enriched uranium, and when it exploded, it destroyed the entire city. This represents the power of the atom. It's one of the ironies of, of nature, one of the ironies of science, that one of the smallest things we can think of, the atom, and what's even smaller than the atom is the nucleus of the atom, which is the very center of the atom, extremely small, contains the most powerful force in the universe called the nuclear force. And that nuclear force, when it is unleashed, is incapable of incredible, incredible destruction. Well, uh, that same nuclear energy is what causes radioactivity. And so when we talk about things being radioactive, it means that the nuclear energy is leaking out of some of the atoms. So the atoms are unstable, and they're leaking nuclear energy. And, and, and once that happens, once you get a radioactive material, Science does not know how to stop it. You can't, sh you can't shut off radioactivity. So that's a problem. Now here's what happens in the atomic bomb and also in nuclear reactors. 
They discovered in 1939 that a certain type of uranium, called uranium-235, when it's struck by a tiny particle called a neutron, what happens is, in this particular case, it splits into two pieces, what are called fission products. And these two pieces, there's hundreds of varieties of these two pieces, because every time it splits, it splits in a different way. And uh, the result is you get a lot of things that you might have heard them before. Cesium-137 is simply a broken piece of a uranium atom. Strontium-90 is another one. Iodine-131 is another one. There's hundreds of them. In fact, there may be more than a thousand of them. And um, these are the things which constitute a lot of the nuclear waste, a lot of the stuff in the fuel bundles. They were not there in the fuel bundle when it was put into the reactor. They are created inside the reactor. Now, in addition to producing these fission products, it also produces more neutrons. And the reason that's important is because the more neutrons can then go on to split more uranium atoms, and so you get what's called a chain reaction. And that chain reaction results, if it's uncontrolled, it results in an atomic explosion. If it is controlled, it results in a nuclear reactor where you control the neutrons to prevent the reaction from getting out of control, and then you can produce a lot of energy over a long period of time. And that's what nuclear reactors do. That energy is produced in the form of heat. That heat is used to boil water, and the water is, turns into steam, and the steam is used to turn a turbine, and that generates electricity. So actually, from the, from the point of view of electricity generation, nuclear energy is just another way to boil water. And it's just, fundamentally, it's not different from a coal-fired plant or an oil-fired plant. Uh, you boil water, you produce the steam, and you generate electricity. That's it, that's what it is. But the advantage is that you don't give off carbon dioxide because you're not burning anything, so that's certainly an advantage. But the disadvantage is you produce this radioactive waste material, which we cannot eliminate or neutralize, and which remains dangerous for t more than 10 million years. So uh, that's basically the, the bottom line. We, uh, we have 84 years of human experience with nuclear fission, and what we've learned is that in exchange for, let's say, three generations of electricity, we have 300,000 generations of nuclear waste. And so my, my friend Bob Del Tredici, who has a kind of a, a way with words, he said, you know, when you look at it from the long view, nuclear reactors really produce radioactive waste, and they produce a substance called plutonium, which has a 24,000-year half-life. That's the main products of a nuclear power plant. The electricity is just a little blip at the beginning. You get a few decades of electricity, and then almost an eternity of a uh, problem. Uh, they want to put the grace underground in hope that they will eliminate those problems because they say, well, it won't come back up again. But that is a dubious proposition because uh, you can't put waste into an undisturbed geological formation without disturbing it. It's no longer undisturbed. The shaft alone has created a pathway that never existed before. And the pressures inside the rock have been disturbed in such a way they will relieve themselves for centuries after the, after the structure is built. And the other thing is that um, the waste itself is not inert, it's active. It's radioactive, but that means it's also thermally active. It generates heat, as I've told you, and it's also chemically active. It turns out that one of the things that radiation does is it breaks apart molecules and creates what are called ions. Ions are, they're kind of electrically charged particles or portions of molecules, and they become very reactive and they cause many, many chemical reactions to occur that would not normally occur. And consequently, you get uh, uh, un unanticipated chemical reactions. There was one situation in Carlsbad, New Mexico, just in the year 2013 or 14, when an underground drum of radioactive waste, and this was not high-level radioactive waste, this was lower-level radioactive waste, but it was from the military. And that drum, chemical reactions took place inside as a result of the radioactivity interacting with kitty litter, which is used as a stuffer, and it produced gases. Eventually, the drum exploded and turned into a flamethrower, 
And the dust, the plutonium dust, actually went 750 meters up to the surface and uh, contaminated 22 workers who were standing there at the top and then drifted downstream to the town of Carlsbad. So um, you might think that these things are never going to come back again, but in fact, there are forces that can drive them back up. Explosions, fires, uh, chemical reactions, and as I mentioned earlier, accidental criticality. You can get an accidental chain reaction that will also do that job. Now, another word about plutonium. Plutonium is not a fission product. The fission products are the broken pieces of uranium atoms. Plutonium is something else. It's heavier than uranium. And it is formed when another kind of uranium, which is also in the fuel, called uranium-238, when, it when it's hit by a neutron, instead of splitting, it simply absorbs the neutron and changes into plutonium-239. And plutonium-239 turns out to be the key ingredient in most of the world's nuclear weapons. Um, so this is a real problem, because if we uh, spread this technology around the world, we're actually creating repositories of plutonium which do not exist in nature. You don't find plutonium in nature. It's a, it's a side product, a byproduct of a nuclear reactor, uh, and it's a derivative of uranium. So um, this glass ball was actually manufactured to be exactly the same size as the ball of plutonium in the bomb that destroyed the city of Nagasaki on August 9th, 1945. The first bomb on Hiroshima was a uranium bomb. The second bomb, three days later, was a plutonium bomb. And ever since then, plutonium has been the explosive of choice in the world's nuclear arsenals. In fact, when they dismantle these big warheads, what they do is they take the plutonium out of the warhead, and that's what makes it no longer a nuclear weapon. So once you take the plutonium out, it's no longer uh, dangerous for that, from that point of view. Uh, I've, I've used this little picture here from the, from the Hindu um, scriptures. Um, there's a god named Vishnu, who one of the fundamental gods of Hinduism, which has many, many incarnations. And these incarnations are called avatars. And in the Bhagavad Gita, one of the avatars is a god named Krishna. And he... And a line from the Bhagavad Gita was quoted by Robert Oppenheimer uh, when the first plutonium bomb was exploded in the, in the uh, South American desert. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Um, this picture, this stat statue represents 24 different avatars of the god Vishnu. The reason I like this picture is because it makes me think about uranium Whenever you hear about uranium, you should think in, in your mind about the god Vishnu, because uranium has hundreds of avatars. Uranium is incarnated in hundreds of different ways. One of those incarnations is plutonium. Another incarnation is in all those fission products, hundreds of them in themselves. And there are still further uh, manifestations of uranium, what are called transuranium elements, such as americium and curium and neptunium. Um, this man here is a, an actor who's holding up a simulated uranium fuel pellet, and the ad is called Small Wonder. And what the man is saying is that, just imagine, this tiny pellet of uranium is able to provide as much energy as a carload of coal. And what's more, it doesn't release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere when it produces that energy. These are the two most attractive features of nuclear energy. The density of energy is, is not comparable to any other energy source. And also the fact that it doesn't, that it's not carbon emitting at the source is certainly an advantage uh, over, for example, fossil fuel plants. Uh, but what he doesn't tell you in this ad is that once you use this pellet to generate energy, you can never throw it away again because it's far too dangerous. It has to be kept an eye, you have to keep an eye on this pellet now for the next 10 million years. These bundles in front of him, as I said earlier, one of these can-do fuel bundles, just one of them would be enough to give that man a lethal dose of radiation in 20 seconds. So he would be a dead man 
if those fuel bundles were not empty or only full of natural uranium, if they were actually the kind of fuel rods that are planning to be sent up here to northern Ontario, they would be deadly and nobody is going to handle them. Even after 30 years of cooling off, they still can deliver a uh, very dangerous and possibly deadly dose of radiation to anybody who gets close to them, even 30 years old. So what is radioactivity? Well, I mentioned earlier that radioactivity is an atom. It, it, it's when an atom has an unstable nucleus. Most atoms don't have unstable nucleuses. When you look at around you, most of the atoms in this room are not radioactive. Uh, and atoms which are not radioactive are, uh, in, in human terms at least, they're eternal. Uh, they never really change. They just enter into different combinations. But the same hydrogen atoms and the same oxygen atoms that are in my glass of water here, these same atoms were around in the time of the dinosaurs, the very same atoms. And they might have been in completely different compounds. They might have been in the flesh of the dinosaur. But it's the same atoms. Now, radioactive atoms are different. They explode. They disintegrate. And they measure radioactivity in terms of dis disintegrations per second. And the unit of measurement is called a Becquerel. And it's named after a man named Henri Becquerel, who discovered radioactivity in 1896. And what a Becquerel is, is one disintegration every second. So it means one, one atom is disintegrating every second. Now, when the atom disintegrates, when the nucleus disintegrates, it gives off subatomic shrapnel. I call it subatomic shrapnel. They're particles and photons, which are very damaging to living things and even to non-living things. And that's called atomic radiation. There are three types that are commonly talked about, alpha radiation, beta radiation, and gamma radiation. It turns out that alpha and beta are actually particles. And uh, they're very dangerous inside the body, but less dangerous outside the body. Gamma radiation is dangerous both inside and outside the body. Gamma radiation is similar to x-rays, uh, but much more powerful usually. So uh, that's what we have here. So these radioactive atoms are like little x-ray machines. In some cases, they're giving off gamma rays. In other cases, they're not giving off gamma rays, but they're giving off particles which can be damaging inside the body. Um, you might have heard of Alexander Litvinenko, the Russian agent who was poisoned in, uh, by drinking tea. Uh, there was a tiny bit of polonium that was put in his tea. And polonium is an alpha emitter. And so when you, when you handle it, as long as it's behind a glass vial, it's perfectly safe. The alpha particles can't even get through the glass. They can't even get through a piece of paper. But inside the body, they are 20 times at least more damaging than gamma radiation or beta radiation. And that's what killed Alexander Litvinenko. It's very dangerous material. And by the way, you've heard of radon gas. That's an alpha emitting material. You might have heard of radium. That's an alpha emitting material. Plutonium is an alpha emitting material. So is uranium. So these things, these things are all alpha emitters. The alpha emitters are among the most dangerous radionuclides that we've ever found. Um, here's a picture of a, a lump of uranium ore in a device called a cloud chamber. Radiation itself is invisible. You can't see it. You can't smell it. You can't taste it. But in a cloud chamber, you can see the tracks that are left by these particles that are given off. And when Becquerel discovered this, he was astounded because those particles, you see those tracks coming off from that uranium atom, they have been going on without cessation 24-7 for years and centuries and even thousands of years and even millions of years without ever stopping. This same rock has been giving off that energy constantly all that time. And uh, Becquerel and other scientists were astounded. How can there be so much energy coming out of a rock? Once again, emphasizing the point, radioactivity is active. It's active. It's not inactive. It's not inert. And that is what makes it particularly dangerous, both in contact to human beings or other animal, other living things. Because what happens here is that the, these projectiles, if they interact with your body in such a way as to damage just one cell in the wrong way, 
And this happens very rarely. But if it damages just one cell in the wrong way, and if that cell is able to reproduce, then over a period of many years, it can grow into a cancer. And, and it's well established that radiation of all kinds, gamma, beta, and alpha, cause cancers, even at low doses of exposure. So you need a fairly large dose of exposure to really suffer immediate consequences. But if you're exposed to low doses of exposure, you will see an increase in the incidence of cancer in the people so exposed. And this has been proven over and over again, and there's no doubt about it. So uh, now here's a can-do fuel bundle. Uh, the, the picture of the hands on it just indicates that it's certainly not, not a used fuel bundle. It's uh, either a hollow one or one that's filled with only uranium. Um, here's all the things that are created inside that fuel bundle. It's only a partial list. It's a list of 211 selected radionuclides that are found in a radiated nuclear fuel. And they're all created inside the fuel, and most of them never existed on Earth before nuclear energy came along. So you can see that we have created this problem out of thin air through the use of nuclear power. Um, now when they put the, uh, this is a Pickering dry storage cask. It's what they use to store the irradiated fuel from a Pickering reactors. And you, you notice inside, you can see those little fuel bundles sticking out inside there. That's a cutaway drawing, of course. Um, those fuel bundles um, weigh 10 tons. But the entire cask weighs 70 tons, which means that the container alone, all by itself, weighs 60 tons. And I often ask people to imagine. Imagine if you had a refrigerator that had a case to put it in, and the case weighed six times more than the refrigerator. Uh, pretty astounding to think that you'd have such a massive case for this fuel. And why is that? Well, that's because they want to protect people, workers, from the gamma radiation. And they need a lot of, a lot of material to block those gamma rays. There's also another kind of radiation I didn't even tell you about before, which is called neutron radiation. That also comes off and they need special things to protect against that as well. Here's where they plan to truck it uh, away from the plant to another site, such as Ignace, for example. They have to take that fuel out of the dry storage containers and put it into other containers, which are transport containers, and then they will be trucking it along the roads up to here. Now, we don't know how many of those fuel bundles might be damaged already because nobody has opened up any of these dry storage containers. And in fact, uh, when they open it up, they may find that there's a certain amount of damage. Every time they're damaged, you have a way for the radioactive materials to escape. So it's possible that when they take the lid off these dry storage containers, there will be radioactive materials coming up right away. Then they put it in a dry storage container, truck it, uh, sorry, in a transport container, truck it up to another site, and uh, you can imagine the bumpiness of the roads and so on, how much shaking there might be, how much added damage is that going to make to the, to the used fuel, we don't know. But it, it certainly points out to you that it doesn't take much, even a pinhole damage can allow radioactive gases to escape, a crack is worse, and of course sometimes the damage is very extensive. There have been cases where fuel bundles have been completely crushed uh, especially when you're using robotic tools, it's possible to have a mistake and the robot itself crushes the fuel bundle. That has happened at Bruce, for example. And here's what happens when they get it to their destination. They have to construct special devices called hot cells. And these hot cells are sealed rooms. They're, they're very carefully sealed to prevent any escape of any of the radioactive materials. And they handle the individual fuel bundles one at a time they have to take them out of the transport container and put them into a much smaller container called a used fuel container for underground burial. And uh, this is what they look like. They look like this. Uh, they're about uh, eight feet long and uh, they're covered with copper, just a thin coating of copper and it's mostly stainless steel under that. But uh, getting it in there is going to be a problem if the fuel is damaged. And if the fuel is damaged, there's going to be a lot of leakage of radioactive material into the local environment. It can't be prevented totally. They will do everything, every possible precaution 
to prevent it massively. But uh, I should tell you that these windows, you see those windows? That's for the men to sit beside. Those windows are three feet thick, and they're made of a special glass which has a high concentration of lead. And it's also made in sections, which, which are in between the sections, they have mineral oil. And the reason for the lead and for the mineral oil is to, is to lower the exposure to gamma radiation and to neutron radiation for the protection of the workers. So you need to have uh, three foot thick windows. Uh, and those windows, by the way, end up being radioactive waste also. In fact, the rooms end up being radioactive waste because they get contaminated with these materials and you can't decontaminate them once they get to that point. So all of that material becomes radioactive waste. The transport containers are going to be radioactive waste too. So um, now here's what the fuel bundle looks like. This is an empty one, of course. This is the fuel uh, burial container, which they call the used fuel container. Um, and uh, it's got about three millimeters of copper on the outside that's sprayed on. But in Finland and in Sweden, where they have uh, developed a similar concept for geological disposal, they use a copper coating also, but their copper coating is 50 millimeters thick. Here it's only three millimeters. And uh, one wonders why is it only three millimeters in Canada and 50 millimeters in, in these other countries. There's no really good explanation for that. Uh, one of the explanations I've heard is that, well, underneath this copper, there is uh, stainless steel. And stainless steel gives the strength you need. And so you don't need a thick coating of copper. But another person who worked for the nuclear industry for 23 years, Dr. Frank Greening, said, you know, I'm really surprised they're using two different metals because it's a common phenomenon that people know about in, in science that when the two metals come in contact, it sets up an electrical current. And, uh, and that's called galvan galvanization. In fact, you can get accelerated corrosion through what's called galvanic corrosion. And that only happens if there's some little penetration of the copper. But if the copper's penetrated, let's say, just in one spot, then you get galvanic corrosion setting in. And you could Google it and take a look at yourself, and you'll see it's a real problem. So, um, so whether this is a wise decision or not, uh, <laughs> it's very difficult for anybody to really prove one way or the other, because all of the resources seem to be in the hands of the NWMO, which represents the nuclear industry which represents the waste producers. So the waste producers are really calling all the shots in terms of design. Now, uh, if you take a look at a 30-year-old fuel bundle, they have to wait for 30 years for it to cool off a bit. Uh, if you look at a 30-year-old fuel bundle, and if somebody, a worker, were to stand in that green area, that green area is, uh, would give you a dose, a maximum permissible radiation dose for an entire year in 40 seconds. So if a worker were to stand in that green zone close to one of these used fuel bundles, he would be overdosed very quickly. And if they got their maximum permissible dose, it means that they wouldn't be able to go back to work on radioactive material, that you have to get new workers coming in to, for them to get their maximum dose, and so on and so on. Uh, this is one of the things that drives up the cost of nuclear energy. Sometimes people wonder, why is it so expensive? One of the reasons it's so expensive is that even a simple repair, which would normally be fixed by a couple of welders, they have to bring in, 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 in New York State, they had to bring in every welder in the whole state and put them up in hotel rooms and pay for their transportation so that they could go in and weld for only, f after getting all the protective equipment on, they could weld something for only five minutes and then they had to leave and another welder had to go in and weld for five minutes and then he had to leave and so on. So this makes a simple job. If it was non-radioactive, it would be a simple job and it would be done in an afternoon. It turns it into a very expensive, laborious, very, uh, very uh, dangerous job as well. So, uh, oh yeah, well this graph, you can hardly see it, at least I can hardly see it, but it's from NWMO. And it's also the first dot on that graph is actually referring to 30-year-old fuel. And it's got a little arrow pointing to it. And it says that that's 10,000 times as radioactive as uranium ore. So uh, just another indication of what we're talking about here. 
Here's a picture of a damaged fuel rod. That's quite a, quite a seriously damaged fuel rod. It's got a, a, a crack the length of it. Uh, the, any kind of damage of that sort, much less damage, will allow for the escape of these radioactive materials. Um, and here's a Kandu reactor working. And if you look closely, you'll see that that square yellow area is where the fuel is. That's called the reactor core. That's where all the radioactive uh, materials are created. They're created in the reactor core. And if you look up there, you see that purple device there? That's, that's a boiler. That's called a uh, steam generator in, in the nuclear language. Now, you'd think that that would be not radioactive. But in fact, it is radioactive, and it has to be buried as radioactive waste also. In fact, there's go each one of these boilers weighs uh, between 100 and 300 tons. And there's going to be, at Bruce alone, there's going to be 128 of these boilers that have to be buried as radioactive waste. Question, how do they become radioactive? Well, they become radioactive because the water passes through the core and goes to the boiler. And guess what? Inside the core of the reactor, the fuel bundles are leaking. They're not leaking very much. They're only leaking a little bit. But that leakage accumulates in the pipes. And so that by the time they take the boiler out, it is a radioactive waste problem. And this is another feature of nuclear power. All of these beautiful materials, the stainless steel and the concrete, everything that's used in a nuclear reactor, ends up being radioactive waste. So you can't even recycle the stainless steel. Some of the best stainless steel in the world has to be treated as radioactive waste. That's called decommissioning waste. Here's one of those boilers on a flatbed truck. They wanted to send 16 of these boilers through the Great Lakes on a barge and through the St. Lawrence River system over to Sweden to, to be melted down and mixed in with scrap metal, which would mean that everything made from scrap metal, including zippers and uh, anything you might think of, would become slightly radioactive because of the radioactive contamination from this material. 400 municipalities in Quebec and other municipalities around the Great Lakes protested against these shipments very loudly. And as a result, those shipments never took place. And now they're planning to bury them. Well, they were planning to bury them uh, in the deep geological repository down near Kincardine, which is not for spent nuclear fuel, but only for the low and intermediate level waste. That radioactive waste project got rejected by the Soviet Ojibwe nation, and so it's not taking place either. So uh, the nuclear industry is kind of up a tree because, you know, for the first 30 years, they never told people that this was a problem. Uh, there's the inside of a steam generator. Those thousands of pipes become radioactive. So why are these tubes radioactive? Well, actually, they're contaminated with many radionuclides. Inside those pipes in the steam generator, there's eight materials having a half-life of over a million years, 13 with a half-life of over 100,000 years, 19 with a half-life of over 1,000 years, and 21 with a half-life of over 100 years. Now, uh, imagine, uh, you'd think that a boiler would not be such a problem. Uh, but what does it mean, half-life? Well, it means that that's the time it takes for half of the atoms to disintegrate. So, after, so that means the radioactivity has diminished by a factor of two. Now, if you do that over and over again, it goes from half to a quarter. Then it goes from a quarter to an eighth, from an eighth to a sixteenth. And if you do this 10 times, 10 half-lives, it's reduced by a factor of 1,000. So it's 1,000 times less radioactive after 10 half-lives. But you know what a million years is. 10, 10, 10 half-lives is 10 million years. So this is why we get very rapidly into very, very big numbers indeed. Uh, this is a list of those radionuclides inside the steam generator. Uh, it's extremely small, and I, I want to make a point of this point. It's the actual mass of radioactivity in the steam generator of radioactive material is only 4 grams. And it's only about 3.6 grams of plutonium. But there is plutonium in those steam generators. There's about 3.6 grams in each one. Now, if you multiply that by 16, because there were 16 steam generators that were going to take, that would be around 54 grams. So you've got about 54 grams of plutonium. I did a little calculation as to how much damage that could do to atomic workers. 
And it turns out that the permissible, maximum permissible body burden for an atomic worker for plutonium is seven tenths of one millionth of a gram. So 0.7 micrograms is the maximum allowed for an atomic worker. If you do a little calculation, you'll see that this small amount, this small mass of plutonium is enough to overdose approximately 500 million atomic workers. Now, of course, there aren't 500 million atomic workers in the world, probably. Maybe there are. But, uh, but that's extraordinary. And what it does is it emphasizes a simple fact. Don't be fooled when people tell you the waste is, is very small. Smallness is not a measure of radioactivity. It doesn't matter about the volume. They always talk about volume. Well, the volume is not the problem. They talk about the mass. The mass is not the problem. The problem is the radioactivity. And no matter how small the volume is, no matter how small the mass is, it's the radioactivity which is the problem. And as you think about back to that Hiroshima bomb and how a single small, of just a, a, a few kilograms of, petone, of uranium can destroy a whole city, you realize that very tiny amounts of radioactivity can do extraordinary damage if it's allowed to escape. And that's why everybody agrees, industry, non-industry, we have to keep this stuff out of the environment of living things essentially forever. Do we know how to do it is the question. The Midas touch is a famous legend where King Midas, everything he touched turned to gold. My friend Bob, who uh, uh, has that way with words, he said, well, in, the, in nuclear waste, we have the reverse Midas touch. Everything you touch turns to radioactive waste. I mentioned about how the containers become radioactive waste, how the glass windows become radioactive waste, how the cells, the hot cells, become radioactive waste. And that's, that also causes the problem to become more complicated and more expensive than you originally intended. Once those materials are out, they go everywhere in the environment. They get into the food chain, they get into the water, they get into the air, and they get into certain organs of the body, depending on the type of radioactive material it is. Some go to the thyroid gland, like iodine, radioactive iodine. Some go to the meat tissue, such as radi uh, to the bones, such as radioactive strontium. Some go to the meat, the, uh, the, the uh, fleshy parts. That's like cesium, radioactive cesium. And it's also very long lived because some of these materials are millions of years in half-life or hundreds of thousands of years in half-life. And so once again, uh, that's why we're talking about such a long period of time in storing these wastes. Um, I'm gonna conclude with this picture that Bob took. Bob is an award-winning photographer. He took this picture uh, of these women, young women, standing beside the Techa River in the, in the other side of the Ural Mountains in Russia, where the Mayak reprocessing plant was built to build the Soviet Union's atomic weapons. And uh, because they were in such a hurry to get the weapons built and to catch up with the Americans who had already beaten them to the punch, as it were, uh, they dumped radioactive waste directly into the river, the Techa River, and these women are finding out on this particular day for the first time why all of their neighbors and relatives and fathers and grandfathers and uncles have, and aunts and mothers have been dying over these years from a strange disease. The doctors were forbidden from using the word radioactivity in talking to these people, and so they coined a phrase called vegetative syndrome. They said that you are dying, these people are dying from vegetative syndrome. We don't know what caused it. In fact, it was radioactivity. And that is the end of my presentation, and I thank you very much for your patience. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Edwards. That was uh, uh, an excellent uh, overview. You know, this is such a large and complex topic. Uh, we have to understand the context, the principles of radiation, nuclear technologies, to understand some of the challenges and complexities of this proposal by the Nuclear Waste Management Organization. And I really want to invite your questions now from anywhere from the most basic to the most complex. This is the first time we've had Dr. Edwards uh, on the road with us here in Northwestern Ontario, and uh, it's a rare opportunity. So. 
Uh, I invite your questions now. Let's try it without the microphone on the floor, and we'll leave it to. Oh, they need to let make for the live stream. Okay. Um, so uh, I think it'd be better if is somebody willing to pass the microphone around I'll do it. for those who wish to ask questions. Is this one live? You have to turn it on. Oh, we've been here before, haven't we? Here, let me try. I think I've learned now how to do it. A mathematician and a sound technician. <laughs> So, uh, first question, right here. I think it's better to go down. And if you put your hands up, I'll try to recognize you so we can move through. Thank you very much for the opportunity to ask a question. And welcome to Dryden. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, my question is, uh, it's implied in your address that the can-do bundles seem to be uh, something that's manageable. You did talk about the risks, and I understand that. But did I misunderstand you? Did, is there a way of handling those bundles, if it was only those bundles, that was economic? One of the things that the local group uh, for this effort tells me is that um, it has to be the corporation that manages all the questions around it, their burial has to be their corporation, their management. Whereas I was thinking to myself, is there an economic solution? In other words, a private enterprise. If we owned the dump and we decided that we would only take one or two bundles and each one of those two bundle, each bundle was worth $50 million, now all of a sudden there's a market for that, for that waste. We wouldn't just be the one repository. Other municipalities would think about it. As it is, we're the only focus. And I just want to know, can we, is there any way of economically burying a, 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 a confined number of bundles safely? Because the way it is, the corporation that's coming is going to decide what and where and how much and the density, and we have no control. In our local dump, when we took it over, we made it an economic center, and we decided what was in there and how much of it and how it would be handled. Hmm. This, this, the way it's being proposed, sounds like it's right out of our control. Uh, I think that uh, my answer would be, is this working okay? Yeah. My answer would be that um, I think it's only out of your control if you say yes. Uh, because you, you do have the... <laughs> If you don't say yes, then I think they're kind of up, you know, they're, they're out of luck. They did try, as I said before, they tried to find a community which would accept all the radioactive waste in Port Hope. Nobody said yes. Nobody said yes. And they end up empty-handed. Now they have an agreement, a written agreement, with the town of Port Hope as to how that waste is going to be managed. Now, in the town of Port Hope, these wastes are quite dangerous. They're going to be piled in a mound 10 stories high, uh, no, seven stories high, sorry, and covering about 14 hectares of land, holding about one and a half million cubic meters of this radioactive waste. But the townspeople have an agreement in which they specify what can go in there, what cannot go in there, uh, and how long it's going to stay there, because they do not want it to be a permanent repository. So, and right now, the company is trying to relax the cleanup standards, and they're saying no. We don't want you to relax the cleanup standards. We have a written agreement. So I think what's very important is, first of all, don't say yes if you don't want to get into it. Second of all, if you do get into it, by all means, make sure that you have a written contract very clearly specified that's legally binding that you can take to court. If you don't want to have reprocessing here, say so. If you don't want to have uh, these unorthodox fuels here from those other reactors, say so. Put it down on paper. And by the way, I would recommend that you say, I would recommend to anybody who was in that position to say as a condition that you don't want this fuel handling plant here. The idea of taking the fuel out of one container and putting it into another, that should be done back where the reactor is. It shouldn't be done up here. It shouldn't be done in any remote community. It should be done where the experts are, where the money and power is, where the waste was produced in the first place. 
So instead of shipping it up in one transport container and transferring it to another one, they should have it all ready for burial in the first place. So there's many things that sort of indicate why this is not a good deal. The idea of selling these fuel bundles, uh, nobody wants to buy them except for one thing. In fact, Canada sold for 20 years after World War II, Canada sold all of its spent fuel to the American military so that they could use the plutonium to build bombs. And uh, that was a way that Canada, the government of Canada, financed the peaceful nuclear power program in Canada by selling plutonium to the Americans for bombs. So that, that went on for 20 years. But there's no other market for used fuel. Nobody wants it. Mm. the final oversight, either by the federal government and also the financing of these programs for storage and the money that is deposited with the federal treasury for that purpose. My understanding in the United States, $88 billion have been set aside by the nuclear industry that has not been used. And my question to you is, are we weak in that area in comparison to other countries, for example, Finland and probably Sweden? And a follow-up on that is, referring to your comments about shipping nuclear waste to other countries, which in all probability has some economic advantage. In Sweden and Finland, my understanding is that these depository sites are located close to the ocean, which would indicate the possibility of them also receiving nuclear waste from other countries for a, uh, a financial advantage. Mm -hmm. And if you could clarify, the first question is, who has the final oversight in what is being approved at mm -hmm. the end? Thank you. Yeah, well, that's a very complicated question, of course, and I don't pretend to know all the answers by any means. But they're all important questions and, and worthy of consideration. Uh, let me just give a partial answer. Uh, we believe um, that, and when I say we, I mean my organization and many other organizations, about 100 different organizations across Canada who have concerned themselves with this particular problem, believe that uh, Canada needs to have an independent agency, independent of the nuclear industry, to oversee this project. There is a fundamental conflict of interest in having the NWMO representing the waste producers in charge of the project. Because why? Because from the industry's point of view, like all industries, they want to grow and expand and survive. And therefore, they, they, anything that they would say against their own waste repository, even if it starts to go badly, um, would be bad public relations. It would be a tremendous embarrassment to the industry. And so there's a conflict of interest. Do we report this publicly and suffer the consequences in terms of public relations? Or do we keep it secret and try and deal with it ourselves? Now in Germany, the latter took place. They had an underground repository for low and intermediate level waste. And it was leaking for 10 years before the industry bothered to tell anybody. And now the government of Germany has stepped in and said this was a, this was a disaster. Uh, not, not well, I mean, the word disaster might be too strong, but it was completely a mistake. And that putting the waste down there was a mistake in the, in the first place. It's now leaking into the groundwater, it's leaking into the surface waters. And so they're now paying over $5 billion Canadian equivalent to send workers down to bring that waste back up again. And the reason for this uh, uh, long period of delay, the 10-year delay, is because the people in charge didn't want to uh, alarm people and give a bad image to the nuclear energy program. So I think that uh, here in Canada, we do not have independent oversight. Simply that, simply put. And even the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission is, by all accounts, a captured regulator, meaning that they have become so close to the nuclear industry 
that they behave more like the coach of the nuclear industry than the, than the referee. Nobody goes to the penalty box, nobody gets penalized. In fact, they have not failed to, they have always approved every single license application that's come before the commission since the formation in 2000 has been approved. They have never, they've never said no to any application. The best they've done is to give a shorter term of license, five years instead of 10 years, 10 years instead of 20 years. But to refuse a license, no, this they haven't done. So I, I think your questions are very well placed. With regard to money, I'll just say one thing about that because this would take far too long and it goes beyond my knowledge. So frankly, I don't really know all the details. I would love to see a cost accounting of uh, what, where the money is all going and how much money is really there. It's not the Government of Canada that's holding this money, it's the Nuclear Waste Management Organization. They're entrusted to collect the money and hold the money. When the Seaborne panel gave its report in uh, 1997, um, it, at that point in time, I raised the question about how much money had they put aside for waste disposal, and the answer was zero. The reason why zero, and that was shocking because they had been collecting from every, from every ratepayer's bill, they had been collecting money for waste disposal. But they have been spending that money, they've been putting it into general revenues and spending it as they collected it. So uh, only with the coming of the NWMO, and I have to give them some credit here, the NWMO was charged with the responsibility of segregating this money in a segregated interest earning fund to make sure that it doesn't get spent by the utilities that produce the waste. On the other hand, I haven't seen an accounting of what NWMO is doing with that money. And that would be an interesting thing to see. The final point that I, I would like to make is that in other countries, such as the USA and, and uh, Britain and uh, uh, some of those European countries you're talking about, Sweden and Finland, they do have scientific agencies which are independent of the nuclear industry, which can provide an oversight function. Uh, for example, in the United States, they have the National Academy of Sciences. The National Academy of Sciences was set up, it was established in order to advise the US Congress on scientific matters. And they have the ability to do studies, which they have done just recently. They concluded a study just uh, months ago, just at the, toward the end of uh, 2022, on these new reactors that are coming along, including the Canadian reactors. Some of the Canadian reactors I mentioned, the Moltex reactor and the ARC-100 reactor, they included those too. And they listened to what the proponents had to say, they questioned them, they, they gave a peer review and they said they did not believe that these were good designs. They didn't believe that these designs were going to really be successful at the cost and on the schedule that they were, they were proposing. In other words, they were very likely to be over budget, over cost, and may not even work properly. So uh, now we don't have any kind of mechanism like that in Canada. There is no independent peer review in Canada. So, uh, the, the government is really going on the industry say so. They're, they're, the industry, they're basically saying, you're the experts, you tell us what to do, and there's no way to, do a, to get a second opinion on it. And I think that that's absolutely disgraceful. And that's been going on in Canada for a long time. It's becoming worse because up until fairly recently, like let's say, let, let's say up until 1978, uh, it was all a Canadian enterprise. You know, there were Canadian agencies, there were Canadians involved, Canadians running the show. Now it's almost all Americans. They brought in American leadership. They have set up a corporation called the Canadian uh, Nuclear Laboratories, which is run and owned by a consortium of multinational corporations, one of which is SNC-Lavalin from Quebec, but the others are Texas-based and UK-based firms that have been involved in the nuclear weapons industry as well as the nuclear power industry. And they are, they're pretty tough players and they're able to push their way through. And the government of Canada doesn't seem to have the ability to really give them uh, a serious scrutiny. So that's not financial, but it's other administrative. Thank you. It's not so much of a question as much as I want to open up your minds about things that we got to keep an eye on. 
I drank a free glass of water, a free cup of water. Delicious water, by the way. If we start contaminating stuff, is that water going to be free? How many people here took advantage of that free water right now? What is your body made of mostly? Water. We start threatening that water, they're going to come after the water, suck up the water, and then tax the water. We got to protect the land, we got to protect the water. I know the big thing here is, it's going to create jobs, money, 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 money. Who do you think is going to get that money? The cashier at the grocery store? No. We got to start giving a about this community and this ecosystem. We're basically playing Russian roulette. Do we want to add rounds in the chambers or do we want to put more chambers, empty chambers? Because inviting that risk is putting more rounds in the chambers. It's your kids, it's their kids, it's their kids. A thousand years from now, the meeting at the um, Best Western, the scientists, the scientists, they said, oh, we, we, we're doing research, we're looking way far ahead of how that's going to impact the ground and everything. It's like, man, we can't even forecast the weather tomorrow properly, consistently, let alone what's going to happen a thousand million years from now. Look at, look at your weather channel, refresh it every hour, it's going to change. You think they can forecast that a million years from now? That doesn't make sense. That's, I don't know what else to say. You guys can pretty much get the idea it's Thank you for and, that. and the fact that we're we're putting our children and we're mon we're monopolizing our children's future and nature and the fact that that's even like an idea it i don't know there's a petition there you should all sign it including the mayor his his name should be the first one on that list okay. if he actually cares about his community okay, if it wasn't about money he would um, th thank you for thank you for that uh, comment. Uh, certainly, it's a it's a sobering thought. I have to remind everybody that nobody is actually planning to to make the water undrinkable. Everybody is hoping to do the best work. Everybody's hoping that this will be safe and that this will work. Myself included. I mean, if they're going to do it, I certainly hope it works. And there is a chance that it will work. I mean, to be honest, there is a chance that it worked, but there's also a chance that it will be a spectacular failure. And this, uh, this point has been driven home in the last few years because we had three underground repositories for radioactive waste since, since about 2010. We've had three repositories which have malfunctioned, underground repositories, two in Germany and one in Carlsbad, New Mexico, where that drum exploded that I mentioned. Now, what we have been advocating, uh, and when I say we, I mean the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility, but many other groups in both the uh, United States and Europe, uh, as well as in Canada, have been advocating for something else which is called rolling stewardship, and that is as an alternative to abandonment. We feel that abandoning this waste is exactly the wrong thing to do, because somebody has got to keep an eye on it. You have to have it near the, not necessarily at the surface, but near the surface and near the people who are the experts and who have the equipment and the knowledge to be able to monitor this material, we know how to package it. We know how to keep it out of the environment for decades. Uh, and we have, but what we don't know is how long that's going to last. So we have to have people ready to repackage the waste if it needs repackaging, to repair the containers if they need repairing, to replace them if they need replacing and to monitor it, so keeping it monitored and retrievable is a very important aspect of uh, our, our point of view. We call this principle rolling stewardship, and it is something that was actually mentioned in the first NWMO report. There is a, a microphone elsewhere with Bernine. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, you're turning off the, uh, thank you. <laughs> I have a quick question and hopefully a quick answer. <laughs> you, you said at one point, just say no. I think don't approve it. I'm trying to figure out how we say no as a municipality. Uh, I don't think we're going to be asked, and that's what really ticks me off. And the nuclear industry has been sending money. Yeah. 
uh, to municipalities, I'm aware of some back in about 2012. They took uh, people from this municipality to Toronto for a week yeah. and wined and dined them in the Royal York. So they've been sending money to all the municipalities in this region for a long time. And I'm that. still trying to figure out how we say no. I don't think we're going to be asked. And that other than lying down in front of the truck. Um, well, it has, been, it has been well reported all throughout the country that uh, they're looking for a willing host community. And they have said repeatedly that if there's a community is, whatever the community is, because they decide what is the community, the community is these three people, these five people, these seven people, who is the community? Uh, and does the community, does it make sense when you have, for example, a site chosen between Dryden and Ignace, uh, why Ignace is more important than Dryden? That, that, that makes no sense, right? So uh, I, I think that people do have to make a lot of noise and insist that this is an irrational project without even defining what a community is. But I have, uh, uh, I mean, for all the bad things that we observe and for all the, the uh, foolishness and irresponsibility we see, Canada is still a pretty good country and I think that it would be very difficult for anybody to try and force this down a community's throat if they're really opposed to it. They tried to do that with Port Hope Waste and they, they didn't get away with it. No community said yes. The important thing is simply not to say yes. Now, I think it is possible to do that, and I think if then you had uh, uh, a force majeure, an act to try and force it down your throat, then I think you would have not just one community uprising, I think you'd have the whole Northwest of Ontario uprising. Because let's face it, you know, nuclear power produces benefits for uh, three generations and toxic waste for 300,000 generations. So the people down south get the benefits, and the people up north get the toxic waste. What kind of a bargain is that? 50-50? I don't think so. Okay, I was wondering if you could go over um, the um, change in the Environmental Assessment Act for the uh, nuclear reactors in the last couple of years or so. I'm yeah. not sure exactly when it happened, but fairly recently. Oh, okay. Well, it, it, let's go back. Let's actually go back a little further. Um, when there was an environmental assessment. Uh, analysis of this deep geological disposal pro idea back when it was only just an idea, um, there was an, uh, uh, an act of parliament called the FIRO, the Federal Environmental Assessment Review Office. And the environmental review of the deep geological repository concept was done under that legislation. And there were eight panel members who were they were balanced in their views. Some of them were pro-nuclear, some of them were not. But uh, they represented all sectors of society, and they came up with some very good recommendations, which the industry did not like. One of the recommendations was that there should be an independent agency, unanimous, a unanimous recommendation that there should be an independent agency separate from the industry to look after, to look after this waste and to deal with the problems. We don't have that. The government decided instead to put it right back in the hands of the industry. They also recommended that indigenous people be given a major role to play in uh, any decision making ongoing and the process should be designed by the indigenous people themselves. That did not happen. So what happened when the Kretschian government approved this, uh, uh, received this uh, report um, from the uh, Seaborn panel, they said, well, we accepted most of their recommendations but they omitted the two most important recommendations, which was the independence and the indigenous role. Now, after that came uh, uh, the Environmental Assessment Act of 2012, which was uh, uh, the Harper administration. And in that case, they insisted that the Nuclear Safety Commission had to be involved in any panel that was looking at any project because they wanted to ensure 
that, it, that, they, that they would get, be able to get their voice in there. And uh, that was the review panel that looked at the Darlington new build, originally the proposal for it. And uh, in fact, they even had their offices, even when they were looking at the deep geological repository for low and intermediate level waste in King Garden, these panel members had to have their offices within the Canadian Nuclear um, uh, Safety Commission uh, framework. So uh, that means that they were surrounded by nuclear people all the time. And it's, it, what kind of uh, independence is there there? None. Um, then we came with the, uh, uh, the New Impact Assessment Act under the Trudeau government. And in that case, the, gov the nuclear industry successfully lobbied to have nuclear reactors largely removed completely from environmental assessment. So that now, the situation today is that if they want to build one of these smaller modular reactors, as long as it's not too big, in a remote community or in a mining area, in the ring of fire or over in the oil sands, they don't have to have any environmental assessment at all. And if they're building any size of new reactor on the site of an existing reactor like Darlington, they don't need to have any uh, environmental assessment at all, as long as it's not over 900 megawatts. So the, the short story to you is that the environmental legislation has been successively kneecapped and made inoperative when it comes to these new reactors. And uh, as I've already mentioned to you, um, the regulatory agency, the CNSC, refuses to consider the waste implications before they license these reactors. So in other words, any, any community that says yes or is somehow forced to accept these ways is going to be um, doing so without any forward planning ahead of time. Okay, so I just have a small question about uh, like other methods of energy. We all know that fossil fuels aren't a great idea given what they've done to the environment. And obviously, like you said, for nuclear waste, um, three generations get the goods and after that it's yeah. kind of bad for everyone. So what's a good alternative? Like we have solar energy and we have hydro, but what's the best, what, what's the best possible? Sort well, of th thank you very much for that. Uh, all, all energy systems do have downsides. There's no, there's no such thing as a free lunch, as is often said. And so it would be wrong to say that there's any energy system which is completely free of negative implications. Um, however, um, it turns out that the one thing about these renewables, particularly wind and solar, is that the price has been going down every year. It's been going down. And the only year in which it actually went up a little bit was the last year, and that was largely because of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine and the inflation that took place. But it actually has been dropping, 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 dropping. The price of nuclear has been going up and up and up and up, and it has never stopped going up. And in fact, these new reactors are almost certainly going to cost more than the, than the old reactors. Uh, although the government doesn't think so. But they have no independent review to show that. Um, so uh, already renewables are four times at least cheaper than nuclear and fossil fuels. And they're at least four times faster to deploy than either one of them as well. So uh, the International Energy Agency, and you can go and Google this on the internet, the International Energy Agency is predicting that in the next five years worldwide, 90% uh, of the new electricity installations around the world are going to be renewables. And it, they're just so much cheaper. Even in China, where there are building new reactors, uh, people often say, well, what about China? They're building reactors. Yes, they are, but you, what people don't point out is they're building 10 times as much solar and wind as they are nuclear reactors. So um, our 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 recommendation is that if you really have, if you really feel that climate change is an emergency, finally, after 40 years of, of, of hiding your head in the sand, if you finally have got around to saying that climate change is an emergency, you should do what's cheapest and fastest first. And what's cheapest and fastest is clearly renewables. So they should be investing massively in renewables. Instead, what are they doing? Premier Ford in Ontario canceled all contracts for renewables paying a penalty out of your wallet of $250 million in penalty for breaking those contracts and instead invest billions of dollars in rebuilding those old nuclear reactors at Bruce and Darlington. So, so our government is not representing our interests, and big surprise, 
But, uh, but I do feel that uh, with this nuclear waste uh, looming over your heads, it perhaps gives you an added incentive to say that uh, uh, you have to exert whatever power you have in a democratic society to uh, see that you don't get stuck with something that is to your detriment. Now, um, so going back to your question about renewables, I believe that an all renewable energy future is quite possible. Germany, whatever you think of German people, they are not stupid. German people have very fine engineering, they have very fine science, they have very fine music, they have very fine a lot of other things. But they have, they have shut down the last three of their nuclear power plants on April the 15th, just a, f just a few days ago. In 2022, they said that, the, uh, sorry, in 2010, 2011, they said that they would shut down all of their 17 nuclear reactors by 2022. And by golly, they did it, except they extended the deadline for one year because of the Ukrainian war. So uh, they've shut down all of their nuclear reactors, and they've said that they're going to shut down completely all coal burning as well in Germany by 2030. And they are aiming for a completely 100% renewable uh, country. And a lot of people don't know it, but Germany in the last year has actually been selling electricity to France because France, which has uh, lots and lots of nuclear reactors, they're swamped with nuclear reactors, half of them are not working for a variety of reasons. And so they have had a shortage of power and they've been buying electricity from Germany. And yet people sort of get the impression that Germany is crazy for shutting down their nuclear reactors. In fact, they seem to be just ahead of the game. Doctor, I wanted to thank you for the way you've handled the questions up here. For everybody here who wasn't part of the NWMO presentation, as I recall, we had to submit our questions to the moderator first before hearing anything from them. They were vetted, and one of the questions that I specifically asked and wasn't allowed to ask in this open forum was not one that was answered. So I asked it outside the building, and I was apparently lied to because you touched on three failures of similar repositories. And I asked that pointed question is, have there ever been any in the world, such as what you're proposing here, that we can look at and say, is it a success or failure? I'd like you to comment a little bit more on that because that was important. The other thing that I do distinctly remember from the NWMO presentation was it's a huge no-no to have any of this stuff in a seismic area. And there have been earthquakes in that revel, revel area more than once. Can you comment on that? And I know you're yeah. not a seismologist or a geologist, but can you yeah. comment on those two things? Pardon me Thank if you. I sit down. My legs are not great, so I'm just going to sit for a little minute. Um, yeah, those are very good questions. And uh, with regard to your first question about have there been any other repositories in the, anywhere in the world, like the one we're talking about. There are two other countries which have been pursuing similar plans for deep geological repositories. None of them have an operating license. None of them have actually put spent fuel, radiated nuclear fuel, into those repositories. In the case of Sweden, they have not even started building it. It's only a proposal. In the case of Finland, they have built it. It's called... It's called um, uh, Gosh, at the moment I've drawn a blank, sorry. But, but it's a, there's a fascinating film about it, in fact. But they've already built this repository, and it's quite different from what NWMO is proposing. For one thing, it does not have a vertical shaft, which is a crazy idea, in fact. They have a wa gently winding ramp that spirals downwards. You can drive a, a big wheeled bus quietly and slowly down that ramp to the lower levels of where the repository goes. Um, uh, it's very difficult when, when you have these uh, fuel containers, they're radioactive, they're too radioactive for human workers to handle them. And if trying to put them on vertical shafts and get them down there is really uh, bad science, bad engineering. But it's not operating, it's simply, it's simply a concept that they believe in and they hope it will work. Um, nobody doubts that they can put the waste down there, nobody doubts that. 
Everybody knows that you can build a hold, you can construct a repository, you can put the waste down there. That's not the problem. The problem is, will it stay there? That's the problem. And that we have no answer to. We have no answer to because we don't even have any principles of science that would allow us to make predictions over that length of time when it comes to living things like the Earth. The Earth is a living thing. It's not just, not just the animals and birds and trees and plants. The Earth itself is a living thing. We know with the plate tectonics and the earthquakes and, and everything. Um, so w we simply have no way of knowing whether that waste is, is uh, going to stay there or not. We could be lucky. We could put it down there, seal it all up, and it could, in fact, work. It's possible. It's also possible that it doesn't happen. And those failed repositories are a reminder to us that we cannot be, uh, you know, arrogant when it comes to nature. The advantage of the rolling stewardship concept is this. While it is not a permanent solution any more than deep geological repository is, it's not really a permanent solution, but it is a responsible way of managing the waste. And it's intergenerational. It means that you have to go from one generation, has to pass on the responsibility to the next generation, and then on to the next generation. And this idea is called rolling stewardship. And it means that like a fire department, or like a police department, or like any kind of agency you might think of, even though the individuals go away, the, the, the institution remains and lives up to its job to put out fires or to look after the radioactive waste. And future generations, remember, this waste is only 84 years old. All of these materials are only 84 years old, with a few exceptions. And uh, who knows what's going to happen in the next 200 years, 300 years. It's quite possible that science will advance to the point where we know how to actually neutralize this waste, where we learn how to turn off radioactivity, where we learn how to destroy this radioactivity. I'll just give you a, a, a sort of a science fiction example. This is all fantasy, of course, but you, if you watch Star Trek on uh, TV, as I do, uh, they have these lovely transporter booths, which uh, McCoy doesn't like at all. But uh, the transporter boys allow you to trans transmit people and things uh, through empty space to down to the surface of a planet, for example, without any danger. If we had such a device, we could beam this radioactive waste into the center of the sun, and it would genuinely be gone. The temperatures in the center of the sun would rip those atoms apart into individual protons and neutrons. It would actually destroy the radioactive waste. But we don't know how to do that. And so since we do not have a solution, why should we fool ourselves into thinking we do? Uh, we don't have a solution for ending cancer either. We don't fool ourselves about it. What we do is we improve the treatment. We improve the technology for treating cancer. We know that we can't totally eliminate it. Same thing with these wastes. We should improve the way of looking after it, but not abandon it. So you just say Wade my, my way right in here because that was my question. Is there a group or a spot on the earth, maybe, maybe in Germany, where there are these brilliant scientists that are actually working on finding a way to decontaminate or whatever or put back uh, that uranium into a situation where it would be you'd be able to handle it, and how much money is being used on that kind of uh, development, in it, or is there any interest at all? They're just, they're just going to leave it where it is and never do anything about it. Uh, at the moment, I have to tell you that there, uh, nobody in science knows of any way to destroy this waste or to neutralize it. There are plans for... There are plans for some, if you can take some of the long-lived materials, the things that last for like a million years, in some cases you might be able to put them into another device, like an accelerator or a reactor, and smash the atom down to the point where it's still radioactive, but has a much shorter lifetime. So you could go from a million years to maybe a hundred years, let's say. That would be an improvement. It's still a problem. It's not, it's not solving the problem. 
but it's an improvement. Uh, however, they've made very little progress on that so far. And, uh, and unfortunately, I have to confess, that when they do this, they generally make more radioactive waste in the process. So, so if you put something in the reactor in order to eliminate it uh, by, by, uh, by, by neutrons, for example, simultaneously you're creating a whole bunch of other radioactive waste at the very same time. And in fact, those people who tell you that you can recycle this waste fuel into new reactors are, are, are telling you a fairy tale, Because it turns out that inside the can-do fuel bundle, there is about one half of 1% of material called plutonium. I've mentioned it before. That plutonium can be extracted and it can be used as a reactor fuel. But when you use it as a reactor fuel, not only are you not getting rid of the old fuel, which is most of which is still there, but you're also creating brand new f waste uh, through the operation of that reactor. So you're actually multiplying the waste and not reducing it. So when people say that recycling the used fuel is going to eliminate the waste, that is a complete, that's a complete lie. It's not true. But they do have the aspiration to extend the lifetime of the nuclear industry, and they figure they can do that by extracting a little bit of plutonium using it as fuel, and then after that, extracting a little bit more plutonium using it as a fuel. And you can do this several times until the plutonium sort of dies down to nothing. Uh, the danger of doing that, besides the fact that you're generating a lot more radioactive waste in the process, the danger of doing that is that when you make plutonium available for civilian use, you also make it available for military use. So it means that it's much easier for people to make bombs uh, once they know how to get that plutonium separated from the radioactive waste itself. So there's a downside to that. It's a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde situation. Thank you so much, Dr. Gordon, for being here. Dr. Gordon Edwards. My question is, okay, we are going to be transporting, if it should take place here, transporting over 1,700 kilometers this waste on bad roads. How much emissions, gamma rays and neutrons, mm -hmm. For how, what kind of a distance from that vehicle would there be emissions that people could be affected from? Well, uh, as a matter of fact, everybody along the route will be exposed um, to radiation, small amounts of radiation. Um, for example, people living beside the highway will, as the truck passes, they will, they will be irradiated. Um, a car following such a truck would be irradiated. A car passing the truck in the opposite direction would be irradiated. As a matter of fact, in the environmental impact statement that was put forward in, in the 1980s, uh, before the Seaborne report, on the concept of geological disposal, they had symbols for these. They called them P-move, P-stop, P-same, and P-op. And what they all had to do with was population doses, the P standard for population dose. P move was the, the population dose for people who followed the van or move it in the same direction as the, as the truck. P op was for people moving in the opposite direction. P, uh, excuse me, P move, P stop. Oh, P stop was for the people living beside the road. That was their stop, right? Also, if they, if they wanted to refuel the truck, the people in the gas station would be exposed to radiation for a longer period of time. So that would be part of the P stop. Then there's P same, which is people moving in the same direction, and P op, which is people moving in the opposite direction. So they know that there will be small radiation doses. Now they say, well, that's very small, very small. But the danger is that this is going to be happening for 50 years. These trucks are going to be moving across, and many of the same routes are going to be used over and over again, so that you get an accumulated dose which builds up over the years. And how large that dose is, is a matter of how well they're willing to shield it. And that costs money. The more they try and shield it, the more heavy it gets, and the more it costs. And so they have to make a judgment of how much are we willing to expose you to radiation versus how much are we prepared to pay for the shielding. And, and by the way, it's not only gamma radiation, it's also neutron radiation, 
which is worse than gamma radiation by a factor of at least 20. Some say even as much as a factor of 100. Neutrons turn out to be far more damaging than gamma rays. How would that affect the newborn? Uh, pregnant women are particularly susceptible through their newborns. And uh, in fact, you see, the thing about the reason why radiation is good for fighting cancer is because it's very much more destructive with cells that are rapidly growing. Cancer cells are rapidly growing. And so when you zap cancer cells with radiation, you kill them, you damage them more effectively than the healthy cells. And so uh, that, that makes them good to work against cancer. But what else has faster growing cells? Embryos. Embryos are really fast growing too, they're not cancers. But radiation is very damaging to embryos and to small children. And so they're much more susceptible. And women, not even, even pregnant women, but women as a whole turn out to be a lot more damaged by radiation than men. And uh, this has only been fairly recently discovered and, and popularized, but it is a scientific fact. Now, another thing that they've discovered with newborns, with pre prenatal uh, people who before they're born, they found that radiation exposure at a certain level to the embryo, to the, um, embryo inside a mother's womb uh, can cause mental retardation. And this was a first of all observed in, uh, after the bombing of Hiroshima. They found that pregnant women who received relatively small doses nevertheless gave birth to children who definitely suffered from mental retardation, which was related to the radiation dose they received. Later on, they discovered that that's also true for pregnant women who had medical treatments, radiation medical treatments, that their children also suffered the consequences. In fact, Alice Stewart in England showed that with pregnant women who get a single x-ray to their abdomen in the, uh, I think it was the first trimester of pregnancy, a single x-ray was sufficient to cause a 50% increase in childhood leukemia in the children who were born. And when she proved this uh, in England, the International Nuclear Energy uh, uh, Community was outraged and attacked her as being a, a, some kind of a crackpot. So she did the whole study over again for the entire British Isles and proved the same result even more strongly. And then it was later done in the USA by McMahon at, uh, at Harvard University. And nobody doubts it anymore that she was absolutely right. So pregnant women and infants are much more, and women in general, are actually much more susceptible than adult males. And the interesting thing is that when you look at any radiation protection textbook or manual, they have a diagram of a, of a human body being exposed to radiation. And guess what it's called? Reference man. There is no reference woman. There's just reference man. There is no reference child. So they calculate, they do all their calculations of radiation based on reference man. Gordon, I was reminded there was a second part to the question here about seismic risk. And then we've what got was the, one. What was the second part? The second part. Richard, do you want to repeat the second part? <coughs> Sorry, thanks. Yeah, the second part was this. I distinctly remember them saying that one of the big no-nos was storing this um, oh. waste anywhere near a seismic area. It's well known and documented that the Ignace area, Revel Township, has experienced earthquakes. And can you comment on, on that? I, and again, I know you're not a seismologist or a geologist. Well, uh, that's a tough one for me to answer. As I say, it's way beyond my field of expertise. Uh, of course, earthquakes are um, not only unpredictable in occurrence and in um, uh, uh, violence, you might say, but there, the results of them, the after effects, are quite unpredictable as well. So. Um, you have to remember that you can't put anything into an undisturbed geological formation without disturbing it. They build the shaft, you're disturbing it. You excavate these rooms, you're disturbing it. This is no longer an undisturbed geological formation. And when you plug the shaft, the question is, is the plug that you're using as strong as the rock that was there before you built the shaft, right? So all of these things have to be borne in mind. You also have to realize that actually building the shaft causes more fracturing of the rock around. It's not only the shaft, but there's more fracturing that is caused. 
And more fracturing happens even after the shaft is completely finished. It takes centuries for more fracturing to occur as the pressure relieves itself. The, the underground geological pressures relieve themselves. Um, so an earthquake could come along in such a way as to make what was already looking a little bit dicey to turn it into a much worse situation. Could, for example, unite those cracks and make them into a pathway where radioactive waste could travel much, much faster to the environment. And uh, so all I can say is that it's certainly a reasonable assumption. I'd just like to mention one thing, and that is that, uh, um, well, now I forget what it was. It was about the tsunami. It was about the tsunami off Japan. When that earthquake struck, and uh, that earthquake, actually, you know, the nuclear plant shut down safely after the tremor. The tremor of that earthquake, which was huge, uh, the reactors safely shut down. They stopped the fission reaction from occurring. And they did that by stopping the neutrons. If you stop the neutrons from traveling around inside the reactor, that stops the splitting of uranium atoms. And that's called shutdown. So these reactors were shut down when the tsunami arrived. The tsunami took about half an hour to get there. And by the time the tsunami arrived, we had the reactor safely shut down. Then they were flooded with the water from the tsunami, and all of the electrical backup systems were drowned. And so there was no longer any way to run the pumps. And why was that important? Because wasn't the reactor shut down? Yes, but the radioactive waste was still there. And the radioactive waste alone generates heat. In fact, it generates about 7% of full power heat the moment you shut a reactor down. The heat from the radioactive waste inside is still about 7% of full power heat. That's more than enough to melt the core of any reactor. And so the result is, oh, I'm, I, know, I remember now what I want to say. How many people in this room, I wonder, do remember that years and years ago, the president of the Nuclear Safety Commission, which was then called the Atomic Energy Control Board, was fired. Her name was Linda Keene. And the reason she was fired was because she insisted that, that, that the Atomic Energy of Canada Limited fix a problem which they had not fixed for over two years. And that problem was to put a seismically qualified electrical backup system into their reactor. They had not done this, even though they had been promised to do it, and it had been promised. So they had not put in the seismically qualified means that it can, it can survive an earthquake, right? Now, the reason for that, and the, the ironic thing is, this was before Fukushima. What happened at Fukushima? Earthquake, no electrical backup, meltdown. So, in fact, she was almost uncannily predicting the Fukushima accident by saying, you gotta get seismically qualified. And she was fired for doing her job. And that's one of the reasons why, in Canada, we know that the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission is really a servant of the industry. The government of Canada will not allow the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission to really do its job and blow the whistle on an important project that's, that, the, that the government of Canada wants to keep running. And that's, that's all I wanted to say about that. Thanks, Gordon. We've got one, two, three, four questions in the queue, five questions in the queue, and we're at nine o'clock which is when we said we would be finished. So I don't want to I, I don't want to make people mm. have to stay beyond their 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 comfort. So I think we're going to cut it off at those five questions unless you're really desperate and then you have to put your hand up and really wave it. So and I've already <laughs> lost what my where my question number 5. Oh, I know beside Al. So I'll just like to take a moment to thank people for their very thoughtful questions. I think the questions have been, have been very good and very constructive. Thank you very much for that. I was raised and I'm planning on retiring in the Diamond area and that's where people say not in my backyard. I saw an aerial photograph of the location and my backyard is in that picture. <laughs> Dear. So what my question is, is we were, you were talking about three generations uh, get the benefits of the power, which when you look in this room, most of us were that third gener or the first generation of the three. How do we get the fourth generation to say no to nuclear power? Well, in my mind, the fundamental problem with nuclear power has been that people have never been told the truth. As a matter of fact, for the first 30 years of the nuclear age, nobody in the public 
with very few exceptions, even knew that nuclear waste existed. Now, the reason why I know this is because I graduated with a gold medal in mathematics and physics from the University of Toronto, and I was considered a hotshot. And I won a Woodrow Wilson Fellowship to go on to graduate school and eventually got a PhD. I didn't know there was such a thing as nuclear waste. Nobody ever told me that. And so I realized that, that the industry had been withholding the truth for 30 years. And while all this nuclear waste piles up and piles up, the people, the politicians who authorized the building of these reactors at billions of dollars in cost, nobody told them there was nuclear waste. So the industry has been really lying to people. Now in Japan, when the accident happened in the Fukushima accident, the, the Japanese parliament is called the Diet. It's called the Diet. And the Diet wanted to get at the root cause of the Fukushima accident. And so they commissioned a major report, which was hundreds of pages long, as to what are the root causes of the Fukushima meltdowns, the tri triple meltdown. And only the, only the executive summary, which is 80 pages long, has been translated into English. And uh, in that executive summary, they say that at the very first couple of pages, they say the primary cause of the Fukushima accident is collusion between the industry, the government, and the regulator, that they have not been telling people the truth. And one of the reasons I learned from personal experience is one of the reasons from some of the Japanese people I talked to, one of the reasons why the, the Fukushima meltdown was so, not only so horrific, but also how much anger it caused in people because they felt they had been betrayed. They, they were sure that they had been told that this stuff was safe, that such an accident could never happen. I remember the mayor of one of the local municipalities saying, I have lived right beside these reactors, and this possibility never was communicated, you know? So it's not just a question that they're being injured and that they're suffering the consequences. It's the fact that they're being lied to by people they trusted. And I think that's the fundamental problem. We've got to get over that. And that's why we need independent agencies, which we don't have. The International Atomic Energy Agency has said, this is uh, an agency in Vienna, which is pro-nuclear. Their responsibility is to promote nuclear power. But they say no regulator of the nuclear industry should be tied to, an, to a government agency that promotes nuclear power. Guess what? In Canada, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission reports to the Natural Resources Minister, the very one who sells nuclear reactors and promotes uranium mining, and promotes mineral exploration of all kinds. So we in Canada are really living not, we're living in a, um, I would say, a democratically enfeebled situation. When it comes to technology, we have to have independent agencies. That's the only way we'll get the truth. Right now, even if you have a man of high ethical standards, and I know some, who work for the nuclear industry, they have nowhere else to go. Because if they quit the nuclear industry, there's no place else for them to get a job that, re that, uh, that requires their expertise. In other countries, they have other agencies that will hire them and that will give them an independent nuclear expertise, which they can use to bring to bear on keeping the industry honest, you might say. We don't have that in Canada. There are two people, Dr. Frank Greening and Dr. Sunil Najawan, both of whom uh, I work with, both of whom worked for the nuclear industry for over 20 years, and they've both become allies of ours because they've seen how the nuclear industry operates. And because of the fact that they were raising problems that need correction, they were both basically uh, became outcasts of the nuclear industry and are treated like pariahs. If you had a good nuclear regulator, that regulator would hire these people and say, thank God we have a few independent people that we can use to help us do our job, which is keeping the industry honest. But rather, they just get rid of these people and they don't want to hear from them. Dr. Edwards, it's been refreshing to have your expertise, your scientific knowledge, and share that here with me this evening. There is a lot of money that is being thrown around at this period of time by the NWA for education. Earlier on, you referred to some of these communities who voiced their objection, and you referred to the size of what that community might be, five or 10. 
My question to you, based on your experience and observation, is uh, because this activity will affect everyone, recognizing, of course, the first priority of the First Nations, but we all live in here. My question is, because we have elected members of our council who represent our democratic wishes, have you experienced, observed, a plebiscite or a referendum by the citizens as a community at large to express how they feel about it? And I go back to the old adage of the person who pays the piper calls a tune. And so that is a concern on my part. But I really appreciate the information you've given to me this evening. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, I do believe that democracy uh, is, uh, is a very thin and fragile thing. And uh, it's very easily lost. And uh, I think that people have to become personally involved in society to ensure that, uh, to me, just electing representatives and then letting them do whatever they want, this is not democracy. Uh, I, I think that democracy involves the active involvement of people. And I think a referendum makes a, a lot of sense. But even a referendum is inadequate if there isn't good information given. Now, for example, in Sweden, years and years and years ago, way back in 1985, uh, Sweden actually passed a, uh, a law saying that they were not going to build any more nuclear reactors. Uh, they're thinking now of breaking that law, but they, they, back then, they passed this law. And before doing it, they had an educational program throughout the country for one whole year where citizens could actually apply for money from the government to help educate themselves about the nuclear question. Any established organization, whether it was a union, a trade group, uh, a, uh, um, a church group, uh, a community center, not one that was formed out of, out of thin air, but one that already had a track record, they could all get money for educating themselves about the nuclear waste question. So that when it came to a referendum, people had some knowledge. They had a knowledge base. They understood what they were talking about. And they voted overwhelmingly for that referendum. I think that that's a model that would be a good one to follow. I, I just have one simple question, and, and a yes or no answer would be uh, sufficient Enough. for me. <laughs> the, the only thing that I'm concerned about is uh, how safe are these containment cylinders uh, when they bury them in the ground? Because if you can say that, you know, for uh, 10,000 years, 50,000, a million years, maybe even 100 years, that they're safe, then that would, that would influence, you know, how I feel. Mm -hmm. If they're not safe, I don't want to know about this, because if they're not safe, if they're going to leak, if they're going to crack, if they're going to corrode, uh, you're talking about all kinds of strange reactions that take place in nuclear reactors, uh, that, those problems are going to be underground. If it's not safe, I don't want to know about it. I don't want <laughs> it. I'm leaving town. <laughs> and, no, seriously, yeah, yeah. Uh, and if uh, our mayor here thinks it's a great idea for council to uh, collect three million dollars uh, uh, from this nuclear waste uh, uh, agency, he should start thinking of what it's going to be like if 20 miles from here we're sitting on top of a nuclear bomb and there's an accident. Mm. What's going to happen to your property values in town? Who's going to want to be here? Who's going to stay here? And where are you going to get your municipal taxes from? The three million dollars from this agency won't look so good then. Yeah. But I just need a yes or no. Is it safe? Well, are the I, containment I, savers safe? If they're not, don't do it. I'm afraid I can't give you a yes or no on that. Uh, what I will say is there's no way it's going to be a nuclear bomb. <laughs> um, if the, if the leakage occurs underground, it's going to be slow and it's going to be insidious. The difficulty is that once it starts, it'll continue for centuries and uh, because it'll just follow the same pathway out to the environment. And so consequently, the, 
the leakage will be worse over time because it will accumulate. But um, I'm more worried about what happens on the surface before it gets underground, because I think handling this fuel above ground, this, these fuel bundles, this is a fact. Nobody has ever handled these individual fuel bundles before. They have always used only robotic equipment to move them around and to put them into containers and to put them into dry storage containers. And they don't even have methods for knowing how many of them might already be damaged. So uh, I believe that one of, the, one of the more dangerous operations will be taking those fuel bundles out of their transport containers and trying to put them into smaller containers. Uh, nobody has ever done that before. Now at Bruce, at Bruce Power, Back, um, I can't remember the exact year, but I think it was around, I'm guessing that it was around 217, I think, 2017, I mean. Um, 500 workers were contaminated with plutonium dust. 500 workers, and these were not even atomic workers. These were local tradesmen. They were plumbers and welders and pipe fitters who were brought in to help with the refurbishment of the Bruce reactor. And for three weeks, the air was filled with this plutonium contaminated dust, and these workers were breathing it during those three weeks. And only after three weeks did the management discover that this problem existed. They could have discovered it right away if they had only taken daily air samples and looked at the air samples, they would have found that there was plutonium in the dust. It's almost invisible, this dust. It's like, uh, it's like sort of, it's less visible than cigarette smoke. So, but if they, had, uh, if they had only tested properly, they would have known that. So the danger here is that the, you don't even know when this stuff is, is, is entering your body because there's no way of detecting it unless you have the correct instruments. And even here where they had the correct instruments, they couldn't detect it for three and a half weeks. So the answer as to whether it's safe or not, I, I can't give the answer to that. What I can say is that they don't have to all be unsafe. You could have 99% of them safe and 1% not safe, and that 1% could do the trick, could make the whole thing unsafe, in other words. There was only one barrel that exploded underneath, underground. They, have, they, have, they had drums and drums and drums and drums of waste in the Carlsbad, New Mexico underground facility, the nuclear waste facility there. Only one of those drums exploded, but that caused a $2 billion cleanup operation after that explosion. So, just the material in one package is enough to cause it a great deal of damage. Thanks a lot for the, all of the information, Dr. Edwards. In 2022, March 2022, the nuclear waste management people released a report at a, a kind of a general report, you could get it from their office. And in that report, it, uh, it tells about six boreholes in the site what they have chosen on, in Revel Township. They gave us the results of three of the boreholes and the other three borehole results weren't, are non-existent. They, they don't exist. And I asked them that question, why that the other three boreholes didn't exist. I said, we'd like to see uh, an assay, a mineral analysis of, that, of them uh, boreholes, and they said they're forthcoming. They're going to make a decision in 2024. We have never seen them, and we probably won't. They had 10 townships. Each township is 36 square miles, 360 square miles to drill, uh, to test, with three sites, and they chose the one closest to the Revel River on the farthest edge, right on the north edge of that large gra uh, granite biathlon. So none of what they're telling us makes sense, first off. The other thing is if they're in a mineralized zone, which they are, if you go to Dr. Ben Friedman's report, it's in Revel Township, Google it, and it will tell you his report, his geolo geological report, and it shows four geological occurrences within two miles of where their site is proposed. So if that's the case, there's not a mine in the country that doesn't have water in it. So we're going to have water. 
we're going to have water in that repository. Absolutely. How do we treat the water when it comes out? Monticello, right now in Minnesota, the Monticello nuclear reactor has a leak in it, leaking into the Mississippi River. They discovered it a week ago. Nobody knows how they're going to treat it, and they don't know how to shut the plant down because they need the power. Is that the same thing here? Once they discover that they've got radiation in the water, I mean, that's worse than the rayon gas. How do you treat it? It Does it just run into the Arctic watershed and we all suffer with it? Yeah. Well, again, this is, this is a problem that's beyond my competence. I, I can't give you the answer to that. But one of the problems with brittle rock like granite is that it fractures easily. And uh, the problem is that the f water flowing through fracture, water throwing through rock usually moves very, very, very slowly at a very, very slow rate. But when you have fractured rock, if the fractures match up in a certain way, then uh, you can have um, much, ra much more rapid flow and therefore much more rapid egress of the water. What the industry would like to think is that the water, it, it is true that the repository will definitely be filled with water. There's no question about that. Uh, but uh, what they'd like to think is that that water won't actually get out It'll, it'll be contaminated, but it'll stay in that, in that cavity. The problem is that the wastes are active. The wastes are, among other things, they generate heat. Now, one of the reasons they space the waste out underground and why the repository is much, much larger than you would expect for the volume of waste is because of the heat. They want to put the waste far enough apart that the water in between does not boil. And so they aim for something like 92 degrees Celsius. They'd like to keep the temperature below 92 degrees Celsius. Because if the water boils, then you get steam pressure, and that will push the water out uh, and make it more likely that this stuff will reach the surface. That's also why some of these unorthodox wastes that I was talking about earlier are not, ad not advisable. For example, sodium metal reacts violently with water and creates more heat so that will push the temperature beyond the 92 degrees to over 100 degrees, and then you get steam buildup, and then you have, a, another, you have another problem. I also I mentioned the accidental criticality. Uh, an accidental nuclear chain reaction would certainly, that would blow the integrity of the repository to kingdom come, basically. So you really have to uh, uh, look at the situation from the point of view that we do not know. We scientists, intelligent as we may be, we do not know. And in fact, until nuclear waste burial was raised as a subject, everybody regarded geology not as a predictive science, but as a descriptive science. It describes what's there. It does not predict what's going to be there. And the nuclear industry has said, well, we need to make predictions, so you have to develop the science of geology so that we can predict. And uh, as a result, we have uh, the US Geological Survey published a, a document on this years ago. And uh, they pointed out that there are hundreds of fundamentally unanswered questions about geology that remain to be answered by science that would be actually needed if you really wanted to have certainty that this waste will not get out. So um, we're going on a lot of guesswork, and we're going on engineering mentality. The engineering mentality is that if you have a problem, you can solve it, and engineering can solve it. Now, I, I, I'm not one to look down on engineers. I think engineers are great, and they can do good things. But that's why I think rolling stewardship is a much more sensible thing, because when things start going wrong, call the engineers, and they'll fix it. They'll repackage the waste. They'll plug the leak. They'll retrieve the stuff that leaked out. They'll prevent it from getting into the environment and so on. I think that rolling stewardship is a much more responsible attitude towards this awesome waste that we've created rather than um, abandoning it. Because they're talking about just putting it beyond human control. That's not really a sensible way, and it's very, very unfair. Future generations will be suffering from amnesia. They won't know that it's there and they'll be suffering from a lack of expertise as to how to deal with it if it does get out. Meanwhile, and I think this is the bottom line, meanwhile, we should stop producing this waste. 
we should stop producing it. And in fact, that's what And I have to tell you that that's what really started this whole process going because in 1978, the Ontario Royal Commission on Electric Power Planning published a report called A Race Against Time. And that report said that unless the industry can solve the waste problem, there should be no more reactors built. And that's why the industry is so eager to find a spot where they can say that they can solve the problem because unless they can prove that they can solve the problem, they will not be allowed to continue to build more reactors. In other words, they have to stop making the waste if they don't have a solution. Well, the fact of the matter is they don't have a solution, but they still want to keep on making the waste. And another point that many people don't think about is that the industry likes to pretend that the reason they're putting it underground is to make the earth safer, to make the surface safer, right? However, they can't put it underground until it's 30 years old. So no matter how fast they put it underground, there's always going to be 30 years worth of unburied waste right where the reactors are operating. So unless they shut down those reactors, you're never going to have a safe surface. No matter how quickly you bury the waste, it's always going to be the old waste you're burying, not the new waste that is being produced. Thank you for letting me speak. Uh, the end of March, uh, the NWMO had brought in representatives from Sweden and Finland. They also, there was a gentleman up sitting beside them. His name was Tom Isaac. He's, he was involved in the, the nuclear waste, uh, uh, trying to find a location to store it. They've been all through the U.S. and they've, they've have, haven't had any success as of yet from what he spoke long term. Um, one thing that he did say, uh, while well, he is a, a member of the NWMO, and I don't know if there were some people there at the meeting, uh, I got a feeling that uh, I wanted to ask the question, and my question to him was going to be, how much are you, are you willing to pay to have it buried in Canada? <laughs> but that would have really... Uh, <laughs> I, I was going to get to the point in regards to that. Uh, so they're looking, and the proximity to the U.S. at this proposed location, I feel it could re really be taken advantage of. Uh, uh, what's your feelings on that? Well, let me tell you, some years ago, um, the U.S. government wanted to build a radioactive waste repository just like this one, DGR, uh, for irradiated nuclear fuel in Vermont, just across the border from Quebec. And I myself went down to Vermont and was on several panels. The governor of Vermont was very gracious. She had me uh, uh, accepted as a, an expert on the other side of the case. And um, they, they were told at that time that they had to build a repository in Vermont because it was the highest law in the land. The US Congress had passed a law saying that there had to be a waste repository in the northeast as well as in the southwest. The southwest was the Yucca Mountain site, which some of you may know about, which has now been abandoned by the Obama administration and is not being considered anymore as, a, as an acceptable waste repository. And the other one was going to be in the northeast, and that's how Vermont entered into the picture. Well, at that time, citizens of Sherbrooke in Quebec uh, had a member of parliament named Jean Chrétien, uh, uh, named Jean Charest. Jean Charest was uh, uh, the MP from Sherbrooke. And he went to uh, Moroni, he was part of the Moroni government, and he got the Moroni government to send a letter to the White House through the ambassador to say that Canada would not look kindly on a waste repository in the United States where the waters run into Canada. So we actually stopped that waste repository. You know what they did? They went back and rewrote the law so that it was no longer required to have a waste repository in the north, what, Northeast. I think that that's a wonderful example of how, you know, something that seems to be a done deal where there's no possibility of reversing it, never say, never say no, because anything can be reversed when it comes to human affairs. What cannot be reversed is... Uh, doing the wrong thing permanently with this fuel. And now, Dr. Edwards, 
team has told us we're in our own race against time. So we have time for one short question and one short answer, and then we'll have to say goodnight. No, thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, my question is, in the past, they had to bury the waste that they created near where it was generated. Who and when was it decided that they would take it from the lo locusts or the, the location where it was generated and transport it, like in our case, it would be the, I measured it actually, the distance between Bruce and here is the same distance between here and Calgary. So that seems ridiculous. And why isn't it that they're, gen they're sending it straight to a place where no one lives instead of where we all live mm -hmm. along the Trans-Canada Highway? Well, everybody thinks that there's places where nobody lives. <laughs> uh, people down south think nobody lives up here. Uh, <laughs> You know, so you have to be careful what you say in terms of where places where nobody lives. There, there seems to be people living in lots of different places. And don't forget, we're talking about future generations. Who knows where, where, where one time there's nobody living, there could be a major metropolis in the future. So I don't think that that kind of thinking works very well. However, I will say this. In both Sweden and Finland, the repositories that they are planning to build and use are right close to the nuclear reactors that are now operating. They're not far away from it. Of course, they're not as large a country as Canada is. But uh, it was the nuclear industry that uh, suggested, and, and get a load of this. This is, what the, this is almost the exact wording. They say that when the reactors were built, there was no, at that time, there was no consciousness or agreement from the citizens living there that they would accept the waste. Therefore, we should put it somewhere else. So, I mean, talk about logic, talk about perverted logic. Because, of course, there's nobody here that wants it either. But the point is that they thought that, well, because they, it would be unfair to stick them with the waste because they, uh, it, it was produced without their knowledge, you might say. Who didn't tell them about it? The nuclear industry. But they think that if they can go to another place and if they throw enough money around and make enough uh, um, advantages available, that people will consider it's a reasonably good deal. That, okay, uh, and this is what they did with the Port Hope Waste. They come up here and they said, you tell us what you want. You want a new hospital? You want a new library? You want a new school? Whatever you want, uh, will you not take the Port Hope Waste in exchange? It's a bargain. So they're thinking that they're bargaining and they think that all this money they're throwing around is just part of the bargain to sweeten the deal. That's correct. Absolutely right, and I think you're absolutely right, and this is why I'm in favor of rolling stewardship. I think with, with rolling stewardship, I think there would be a, much more quickly an end to the nuclear production of waste. I want to thank you all, and I really want to thank our, our technical team, uh, Point Blank Productions, who have been very patient as we went beyond the time uh, we'd, we'd estimated. Wonderful questions, great attent attentiveness, and I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you to the tech team, the local groups, uh, Sunset Country Spirit Alliance, No Nuclear Waste, Northwestern Ontario. You can find them both on Facebook. We the Nuclear Free North, uh, we've got literature out in the front. And most of all, I want to join with you in thanking Dr. Edwards for sharing his time and expertise. <laughs> Thank you all, we'll see you in the lobby.